So you've just bought all of the parts for your brand new gaming PC build, but now you're wondering how to put it all together. Well in this video, in under 15 minutes, I'm going to be showing you how to do the whole thing step by step, from start right through to finish. I'll be covering off all you need to know for both AMD and Intel CPU configs, common mistakes to avoid along the way, and even how to install a liquid cooler in your new gaming PC build, so that no matter how complex your part selection, you should be able to get your new build assembled in no time. Let's do this. The Asus ROG Swift PG49WCD is an insane 49 inch super ultra wide panel that packs a punch. With a vibrant QD OLED display, 0.03 millisecond response time and 144 Hz refresh rate, this thing is crazy. The 1000 nits peak brightness, backed up with a custom heatsink design and improved airflow, keeps the panel bright and prevents burning. While a built in KVM and 90 watts of USB C power delivery makes this a great monitor for a multitude of applications. Learn more at the first links in the description below. It's worth noting that any gaming PC build you assemble should have at least eight core components to make it up. And while I won't go into too much detail to the parts I'm using today, they should be pretty representative of the kind of build you guys will assemble. There's a few different orders in which you can build a gaming PC, and no order is really right or wrong. But my system always starts with the smaller components first. That includes the motherboard, both types of memory, and the processor. I'm going for an Intel-based config for this build, but I'll explain how it differs as we go. So if you've got an AMD chip, don't need to tune off, we're going to cover that too. Now, first things first, let's look at the motherboard. And specifically, we're going to take it out of the box. Your motherboard might be packaged in an anti-static bag. If it is, it should look a little something like this. Remove it. We don't need that. If you end up returning or selling the motherboard, it can be handy to have to hand. So don't necessarily bin it, but take the motherboard out and place it on top of the motherboard box. The CPU installation is actually probably the most risky part of any gaming PC build. So getting this right early on is a nice little win to carry us through to the rest of the build. Now you'll see here I've opened up the CPU socket. Let me just show you again exactly how that happens. So we're going to push this arm down and outwards, lift the arm up, then release the socket. Doing things in that order is super important as it assures that we're going to get a good result. I'm going to install a top of the range Intel 14th gen Core i9 in this build, but honestly the process is the same for all Intel chips. Drop the CPU in. Now what you might notice once this is in is that the text is reading upright if you look at the motherboard board and there's an arrow in the bottom left hand corner of the chip. That arrow corresponds with this arrow on the socket cover. So if you line up those golden arrows, that's how to do it. Make sure the arms moved out of the way. There we are. Drop the socket cover back into place. Ignore the black plastic for now. Push a little bit with your finger. That will pop the black plastic off and just make sure that the socket cover is not too stuck, that it's nice and loose and ready to be secured down. Then push the arm into place. That's the CPU. AMD processors are very similar. Simply line up the triangle on your AMD CPU with the triangle on the motherboard lift up the CPU socket, drop the chip in, and secure the socket back into place. Next up is the RAM or the memory, and for this, we're going to move ourselves to the right-hand side of the motherboard, and look for these long RAM DIMM slots. Now, if you look carefully, what you'll notice is that there's a notch on each of these slots. This notch looks like it's in the middle, but don't be deceived, it is not. The notch is actually slightly off-center. Normally, for a dual-channel config, aka two RAM DIMMs, you want to use the second and the fourth slots. Technically, this is slots 0, 1, 2, and 3, so we use in slots one and slots three, but as you look at it, it's the second and fourth slots from the CPU. For this build, I'm going to be using this thermal tape kit of memory, but all DDR5 is broadly similar, and it's all basically going to look the same. If you take a look at the memory, what you'll then find is a notch on the RAM itself, and it doesn't take a genius to work out that we need to match this notch up with the notch on the RAM DIMM slot. So take your memory, push back the clips on the RAM DIMM slot, and slide the RAM in. With the notches aligned, slide the RAM into place, and you'll see there it's seated pretty well. Thumb on each side, push it down. The clips, which we've then pulled back on the slot, are going to snap into place and secure the RAM down. Repeat this for your second dim of memory and we're good to go. Now, you can be careful at this stage, but to check it's in, you can give the board a bit of a tug by the memory. I know people in the comments are going to freak out, James, what are you doing? A little bit of a pull just to make sure it's seeded isn't going to do any damage. Now, once that's been done, I'm next going to move on to the M.2 SSD. There's three different types of storage, really, that you can employ in a build. The first is an M.2 drive. That's what we'll be going for, a super small sort of PCIe-based solution. The second would be a SATA hard drive, which you'll plug into one of the SATA connections on the motherboard. And the third is a SATA SSD. But to be honest with you, in 2023, 2024, and beyond, you'll want a PCIe-based solution for good speeds. It's just a better solution all around. The next step is to then remove these two screws 
screws that hold down this M.2 heatsink. This is where we're going to be installing the M.2 drive into. You might notice on the board as well, there are a couple of extra slots which we can use if we're adding further drives in the future. Handily, this Asus Tough Gaming motherboard actually has a tallest M.2 installation, which means we slide it into the slot, push it down and then add this plastic clip into place. That's when this M.2 heat shield returns into place, but you do need to remove the plastic film on the thermal pad. It's then a case of returning this shield into place. This is just gonna help to keep the M.2 drive nice and cool as these Gen 4 and especially more recent Gen 5 drives can run pretty hot. The thermal pad is a bit sticky, so just be careful. Couple of screws, you haven't got to over tighten these, just tight enough that it gets the shield on without too many problems. Once the motherboard CPU, SSD, and memory is all installed. The next thing to look at is the cooler. Now, if I'm being honest with you, this is the part of the tutorial that's gonna vary the most on a case-by-case -case basis, but I'll do my best to cover off the installation methods for various different types of coolers. A liquid cooler is the main type of cooler you'll see in a high-end build. Basically, what it does is has a pump and a radiator filled with liquid, and it uses this liquid to facilitate the efficient transfer of heat away from the processor and into a radiator in which it can be cooled. The major advantage of this is that it moves all the heat away from the CPU itself, allowing that heat to be processed in the largest possible surface area, which as we all know, if we did basic physics at school, more surface area is always better. The disadvantage of surface area is that it obviously takes up space. It's quite space consuming. So if you're going for a small form factor build, this might not be a viable option. They're also expensive comparative to cheaper air coolers, so it might be budget prohibitive for your system. What I'm about to say might be the worst piece of tutorial advice ever. The instruction manual here is your best friend, as coolers are the one part that vary the most. There are, however, a few common denominators with all types of coolers, which we can discuss to make your life a bit easier. Every single cooler that you use is going to leverage a backplate. Now, a backplate looks a little something like this, but I'll also pop some shots on screen of various other types of backplates that you might come across. The reason these backplates exist is that motherboards, generally speaking, aren't strong enough to support the weights of coolers themselves, especially large tower air coolers. One exception is AMD's AM5 lineup, which have a built-in backplate in many instances, and you'll often find your cooler leveraging this instead of their own solution such as this. Now, with this being an Intel-based config, our board doesn't have a big enough backplate. It only has this bit of metal here, which protects the CPU socket. So we're going to pop the backplate through the four holes around the socket like so, before laying the motherboard back on the table. Now, what you'll be able to see here is four posts poking through the motherboard. They're the posts from the backplate. As a general rule of thumb, this is what we're then going to install the CPU cooler onto. And these almost provide the foundations, if you will, for the cooler to secure into place. Some coolers at this stage will then add a plate which you mount the cooler on. Some you'll just put the cooler straight on top and secure it down with some thumb screws. I always recommend starting the CPU cooler installation now as once we're in the case it gets a bit more complicated and fiddly to access. Not all cases provide a cutout on the motherboard tray for access to backplate area either which is definitely something to bear in mind. This cooler actually requires the installation of these plastic stoppers around each of the backplate posts so I'm going to add these on now and once they're on there isn't a great deal we can do until the case gets involved as I mentioned. That then rounds off what we now call the completed motherboard assembly. And this is basically all the fundamental bits and bobs we need to build a PC. The CPU might overheat without a cooler, and of course nothing's got any power, but you'd be surprised just how much computing horsepower is in that tiny little package. Now this is actually a brand new case. This is Be Quiet's brand new Dart Base 701, and it's actually really, really quite nice from the limited amount that I've seen so far. I'm gonna be really honest with you and say that your PC building experience is gonna be hugely dependent on the case that you choose. A good case like this one is going to be easy to build in, have good airflow for your components, and even look aesthetically very nice. A cheaper case will naturally be constructed of worse materials, have a smaller feature set, and just generally be a bit of a pain in the ass to build in. Remove all of the side panels from the case. That includes the back panel, which I'm sort of struggling to get off. Aha, there we go. And even if I'm being honest with you, the top panel, which removing is going to just make sure we've got access to all the different areas of the case that we could possibly need. What that's going to enable is very easy installation of the motherboard. Now you want to take a look and check where the motherboard standoffs are. In this build you'll be able to see if I point them out we've got three along the top, three across the middle and three down the bottom. Now handily that matches up with our ATX motherboard. You can see here we've got three along the top, three along the middle and three down the bottom. What that means is that it's a simple case of just sliding the motherboard in. The built-in IO shield also saves us a step there, no need to install the IO manually and the board just slots into place. It really is as simple as that. Now a raised 
centre standoff should actually hold the board in before we screw it down. You've still got to screw it down. That's not a step that you want to miss out. But it's a quality of life feature that a higher end case like this will afford you. I'll link our full review to this case with all the features it has, which I think are useful for building a gaming PC down below. So you can look at this case and others and spot those features for yourself. Finish screwing it in, get it nice and tight, and then the board is installed. Once the motherboard is in, the next step is the CPU cooler. Now we've got a 360 mil radiator to fit in in this case. Let me grab it. And as you can see, this thing's not exactly small. Now there's a few places we could put it. It could technically go at the front of the case. You can see here, it slides in without too many problems. In fact, this quite large case makes it look tiny. Or the radiator could actually go at the top of the case, somewhere around here. And I haven't actually made my mind up as to where I want it to go yet. Uh Hmm. I think the top makes the most sense as it's going to allow nice cool air to come into the build and take air out the top. Whenever you're building a gaming PC, you want good air pressure. So you always want a couple of intake and a couple of exhaust fans. If your case only has a couple of fans included, picking up an AIO or a CPU cooler can be a great way of adding a bit more airflow. I'm going to unscrew the fan mounting rail. Now, depending on your build, this can take various different forms. It might not be removable, so you might have to just install the radiator in situ. But in this case, I'm pretty sure, aha, we can just slide out this top piece. There we are. And that slides out nice and easily. So that's now out. I can remove the pre-installed fan as we're not going to need this. Our radiator, of course, has its own. Now, a little bit of a trick for if you're doing an all-in-one liquid cooler, if you put it over the table, that will get your tubes out of the way. And then you can just add the frame on a little something like this. How dead easy is that? You might not always be able to get every single screw hole lined up, but in this case, we look like we're going to be fine. If you're one or two short, it should be okay. But the common sense should prevail here and make sure that you can get plenty of support in various different areas. All of the screws you need for this stage will be included in the CPU cooler box. All the screws you need for the motherboard will be included in a little accessory box at the back of the case. The accessory box might look a little something like this. I'm then going to add the fans onto the bottom of the radiator. That's going to pull the air throughout the case and into the rad itself. Now, I often line up all the screws first, so I've got four screws in each fan ready to go. And it's just a case of tightening them all up one by one. And with that, the radiator assembly is pretty much ready to go. The only thing then that needs to happen is just for it to be slid back into the case. So let's see if we can get it lined up. There we are. How easy was that? Super, super simple. A couple of screws to secure it down. And I'm going to move all the cables out of the way. We'll cover those later in terms of getting everything wide up and ready to Go. I'm then going to add on the CPU water block. Now, this one actually has pre applied thermal paste, but if yours doesn't, a small grain of rice. I'll pop on screen now an example of when I've done this before. Not a lot, don't want to overdo it. You can see here that the cooler is just sitting over those posts from earlier, while four thumb screws, which can be manually tightened with a screwdriver, are going to actually secure the water block into place. And once that's done, the CPU cooler is all finished. Once that's in, the build is starting to come together, and my gosh, it looks like a PC, or it's increasingly looking like a PC. There are a couple of things left to do. The graphics card is of course probably the most obvious one but don't do that yet we're gonna save that until last and not so you guys keep watching but because installing the power supply doing all the cables and wiring now is a lot lot easier now you get a couple of types of power supplies modular semi-modular non-modular most nowadays are fully modular meaning you only plug in the cables you need for this build we'll need a motherboard cpu gpu and sata power connection i'm going to install all of these into the power supply and then at the back of this case you'll notice there's a little bracket these are thumb screws which can be unscrewed with your thumbs. So take these out, take the bracket out, and this is what we'll be installing the power supply into, allowing us to easily slide the PSU into the rear of the case. A couple of cables we're going to plug up. The first is the CPU, which goes to the top left-hand corner of the motherboard. Often eight pins or four plus four pins. The motherboard is the next one. It's the largest and goes to the right-hand side of the board, often referred to as the 24 or 20 plus four pin. Additional to that, we're going to install a SATA power cable for the built-in RGB and fan controller on the back of this Be Quiet case. That's the long thin connectors that typically power traditional two and a half or three and a half inch storage drives, while a GPU power connector will be kept aside for later. The second half of the cables is the front panel connectors. Now these have the reputation for being fiddly, troublesome, and frankly, a bit difficult. In this build, we've got a few to install. We've got USB 3, which is gonna go to the right-hand side of the motherboard below the motherboard power connector. We've also got USB C, which goes above the USB 3, but still below the 24 pin motherboard power cable. We've got HD audio, which powers the headphone and mic jack, which goes to the bottom left of the motherboard. And then finally, the super fiddly JFP1 connections. These power up the power and reset button. They're often pin based, so be careful. But we'll pop a diagram on your screen now of the right layout. If you get it wrong, don't worry. It just won't work or your power will reset or your reset will power. It's not the end of the world and you can go and flick them around later. You might also have some fan and RGB headers to plug in. These can be plugged into the hub at the back of the case or to headers on the motherboard. They're very easily plugged in, a little something like this. All that that then leaves to do is pop the graphics card in. Now, no 
matter which GPU you go for, whether you're going for a 4070 or a last gen 3080 or an AMD card, they're all going to install in basically the same way. Graphics cards are very unified, making this step very, very simple indeed. Now, this particular card is an Asus Dual RTX 4070 that uses the old traditional 8 pin style power connector. Your card may use a smaller 12 pin power connector like this one. The power supply I've opted for has both options, meaning whatever graphics card you go for, you should be nicely catered. Now, in terms of installing the GPU, it's going to go into the top PCI slot. On modern boards, it might be a different color, have some metal silver reinforcements. And if we hover the graphics card over the slot, that's going to show us roughly where it installs. What you'll then need to do is remove a couple of these PCI slots. So in this case, it's the second and third slot covers. These are going to make way for the graphics card itself to be installed. Once these have been removed, that's then going to pave the way for the GPU itself. Some boards, you'll need to push a clip back here on the actual PCI slot itself. This board has a tallest mechanism. So all we need to do is slide the GPU over the slot, line it up, bit of pressure and it'll click into place. Add back into place the two screws we just removed for those rear PCI lanes and give it power with a single eight pin power connection. Of course, if your GPU requires more power than this, add some more power cables. And once that is all done, you've built yourself a gaming PC. Now you might be thinking, James, I've got no software, Windows, BIOS drivers. Don't worry, we've got a separate video for that which goes through it in detail. It really isn't too complicated. You might also run into some debugging problems and have issues whereby your system won't boot. If that's the case, why not check out the article on our website in the cards now. There's a huge knowledge hub of loads of places and loads of errors that you can help solve nice and easily. Building a gaming PC is going to take you a bit more than 15 minutes and truth be told we've probably gone slightly over on the time limit for this video but if you take it step by step start with the small bits then finish with the big bits you're going to be destined for success. If you found this video useful please get subscribed to see more from us. Thank you for watching and as always we'll see you in the next one.